Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for picking an amazing topic which is really, really very close to my heart. When I was reflecting on what to say in my 15 minutes, I realized that back in the 80s, when I was an undergraduate, what I was really interested in was observing elementary particles at CERN, the Centre de Recherche Nucléaire in Geneva, trying to learn from the traces these particles leave what actually these particles really are about. Then in the 90s, after I did my PhD in machine learning, which of course was learning from data, that there are no strong rules in many cases, but there are data. What can you build in those predictive models? So in the 90s, I then applied what I learned to Wall Street. I worked with Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, where we try to understand, based on the traces traders leave on Wall Street, what's going on. <coughs> then the web came around. And for somebody who loves data, that, of course, was the place to be. So after starting a company, Mood Logic, which we sold, I had to have a quote. And asked me whether I might be interested in working for a big company. I said, no way. Well, that company would be Amazon. It would be working directly with Jeff Bezos. So I decided to take that trip out, check it out, and Jeff is just such an amazing person that it's no longer just about traces of traders, but the traces, traces pretty much of everybody and anybody in the world. So that was about 10 years ago. And what has happened since is that we have got much richer data sources for the creation of data. Think mobile. Your mobile knows so much about you. If you just think about the geolocation or go beyond that, it knows the quality of your voice. What the CIA you know, developed secretly, now you can buy as a 99 cent app, a lie detector. It, of course, knows who you co-move with. The company I'm on the border, Scout. They tell you how far it is from you to that person you might want to date. And it's very hard to lie on these numbers. So I'm interested in how does it change our behavior. So social data, just for clarity, means two things. One, it means the social graph. It means who is connected with whom, and doesn't mean necessarily just binary. The world is not a binary place. For instance, I was at Telefonica yesterday. There, they know how long it takes people to respond to certain calls. So it's actually different strength, and the strength can be very different in one direction compared to the strength in the other direction. When I talk to marketing crowd, I always give an example, an AT&T example, but just using the social graph gives a lift of a factor of five compared to the best state-of-the-art Bell Labs segmentation techniques people used to use. So that is the first meaning of social. Social as a social graph. The second meaning of social is data that people socialize. For me that means data that people Knowing they willingly create and share. Sometimes not quite as well as and quite as well. But in many cases, think Facebook, it is driven by people socializing data, usually about themselves or their friends. So if you want to be part of that platform, if you want to be part of the social data revolution, there's a new A. B, C, that it does. The old ABC was you do advertising, you think about branding, and you do communication. In many cases, one key communication, corporate communication. That's the old ABC. The new ABC is approval. You approve what people do, make them feel good. B, sense of belonging, particularly in this fragmented world. Belonging is more important than it's ever been before. So if you give ways that people can belong, and C, C stands for connection. 
to give people the chance to actually connect to individuals. So I want to make sure, since we are going to talk about social data here, that I make clear the difference between having an attribute about a person, so for instance, the groups you belong to, that's the traditional approach, attribute value pair, that people get described by you know, the hair color, the glasses, and stuff like this. And I want to replace that, I want to make you aware of it, that that basically is nothing compared to our identity based on our social graph. It's a work for the CIA, and it's getting very hard for spies. It's getting very hard for them because any undergraduate in my class can just write an algorithm which picks them up like flags out of their Facebook patterns. I promise, of course, that they are not supposed to you know, have these things like Facebook, so it's very difficult for them to get that notion across that this really has changed. You can't just create yourself 100 friends because the second order properties, of course, are super different. So, at the heart of all of this for me is communication. Human communication, to be precise. There were very smart people before us. And they engineered social systems. They had social norms in Bush that very well were suited, very well optimized for the constraints the past had. Think about most of your companies. They are super good optimization for existing constraints in the past. Most of those constraints are no longer here. Creation of information, free. Distribution of information, free. Gutenberg made the one-sided distribution of information free, but now it's free for everybody, as you know. So the bottleneck has become the consumption of information. And there, we have new ways. For instance, we look at social distribution. Why is Facebook powerful? Because there's two things. One, it has identity, and two, it has social distribution. And that's a good shortcut for knowing what to listen to. The best shortcut we have. So, the underlying pillar, and I predict that the wars, which we will see in the next years, go precisely about the title. The underlying pillar of all of that is identity. So when we talk about social stuff, we always think that yes, we have solved the identity problem. I was earlier this year part of a SWIFT, the organization Belgium working group on digital identity. And I can only tell you it's not as easy as you think. Now, of course, if it's about transferring money, there are certain very restricted ways of identities, but think about it much deeper. Who will manage our identity in the three, five years we're looking at here? Will it be a government which has a piece of paper which allows me to cross the border? <coughs> Do you know, I have a house in Shanghai, and pretty much all of us can use my passport, my visa, and shop because, as you know, all white guys are the same. So I think it really, the paper thing, I think we are pretty much done with. So is it then attributes about the person? Rich attributes, my past? I think it is not. I think identity, and the basis of the social here, is the relationships we have. If somebody broke into my Facebook account, it wouldn't take more in a couple of minutes, that my phone would ring and somebody would say, Andres, are you right? If somebody stole my passport, it would probably take me, I'd rather happen to be at an airport the next time, that I say, gee, I don't have my passport. So I think the identity wars will have a form that Google, I think Google Plus, Facebook, Vodafone, carriers, many different parties will want to play with. So, to ramp down my last few minutes, having opened up some problems which I think will be very hard problems, I have three rules for what I have. 
Rule number one, start with the problem, not with the data. Every other company that's coming to me comes and says, oh, Andreas, we have all this data. There must be some data in here. Can you help us find those actual insights? And after a while, the conversation changes and say, well, why don't we sort of figure out what problem is that we're trying to solve? And then in most cases, it's much cheaper and leads to much better results to actually collect those data, to have people socialize data that solve that problem for them. Second, and I already mentioned the constraints of the past, not being our constraints anymore. So the second rule is, write down the equations of your business. Jeff Bezos and I probably spent 50 or 100 hours going from group to group at Amazon.com and quantifying their what we call fitness function. In Amazon's case, these were all very customer-centric metrics. For instance, um, let's say, some companies might have what's the percentage of items we have in stock as one of their metrics. Amazon has as a metric, well, view weight availability. So we don't care what's in stock. We care for what's not in stock that people actually want. So that you can do online. You multiply the views with the availability. Or maybe a better example is Delivery on promise. So, you all have stories about how things arrive late. And that ultimately is the right metric. Not how long does it take, but what do you promise for the delivery date and when actually does the item arrive. So, these are building blocks in these equations of the business. And my point here is get the equations right. It takes a lot of work. Get the equations right. Don't worry about the individual points in the space, but focus on the axis of the space, focus on the dimensions in order to understand the trade-offs. For all of us who would hopefully try to influence the world to make it a better place, we are about exposing trade-offs. And I think you can only express trade-offs if you put them in a mathematical form, as opposed to talking about mission, vision, and values. And the third rule, is very close to my heart. Let people do what people are good at. And computers, what computers are good at. Don't mix it in the final game. If you take what I've said, you realize that the implications of this social data revolution is amazing. It probably is the biggest change the amount of data, the quality of data that we create which I've seen in the last five, ten years. And it's a huge impact on the future of work, having consistent identity. I think the future of work will be very different from what it is now. Chris wrote about this two, three years ago. It's about the future of self. How do I think about myself? Well, I am, maybe I'm what I share. So it's certainly no longer the conspicuous consumption which we used to have. I just had it spoken in China a couple of weeks ago at a luxury event. It certainly still is the case in some countries, but it's more pretentious production. So every now and then, one of my students replaces his Facebook profile pic by a picture where he and I are on together. That's where I know, hey, I made it. So it's about the future of self, and it's also about the future of relationships. I think I would like to use the last couple of minutes I have and see whether you have questions, whether you have experiences that might fit into this year. Um, Michael. Just yes. Remarkable comments. Thank you very much. What I'd like you to offer is a greater insight into you. I'm sorry. Just uh, for all of you. 
how do as society, how do we come up with ways of dealing with false data about a person? It's not as trivial as we think, because if, of course every every criminal will claim exactly the same things I would be claiming um, in you know whatever case it is. Um, my personal solution, and that might actually uh, be rooted in my dad who spent his 20s as a political prisoner in East Germany, uh, is that you know, the more data is out about me, the less likely it will be that false data actually will basically ruin my life. So if there's very little out about me and somebody comes up and manufactures something carefully, then you know, that's what the world knows. On the other hand, if you know, I share with Google Latitude, for instance, every 15 minutes where I am, you know exactly which hotel I stayed in the last two months when I was traveling, you know which flights I am on. Not that I do anything about it, I just enable Google Latitude, and Google Latitude actually figures out if I do leave money this time and arrive in Madrid at that time, it must have been the A flight. So my attitude is the more I share, the safer I am. But I'm very aware that the more I share, if somebody really is adverse that they can construct a story, which makes it very hard for me. So my plea to all of you is here. Don't put technological reasons why things can't be done. But really let's think about what the social implications are, what we as society need to do, what the institutional norms are that need to shift to actually create a world. If I can just Sorry, just a follow-up, uh, if I can. Um, even if people are willing to share now, I think they aren't really aware of what the implications of that are. And a couple years down the road, they might see and they might want to pull back. Of course, you can't really pull back once your data's out there. So that's more what I meant, you know, what uh, people have been willing to share, but uh, especially some of the young people, and they don't know what it means when they go to apply for a job and things like that. So I had a couple of students uh, write a very nice blog post at the end of Spring Forum. And it was about uh, privacy protectors. And I think I would just like to end with a cartoon with a body and show it right now. Maybe some of you saw that cartoon with a dog behind the keyboard. It was in 93, I think. And it said, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And they just replace the text a little bit and say, on the internet, everybody knows you're a dog. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.